There we go. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> you wonder how the, how I get through this right here, don't you? No. Uh -uh. This part. Of it. No, you're fine. Anyway, I want you to join me in a song. Sometimes we know. I don't know whether you know these songs or not. Sometimes, but if you don't, we'll at least learn. That's right. Change my heart, oh God. Mm -hmm. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I say. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Beautiful song, I'll tell you. I'm new relative to this uh, congregation. Sometimes I don't know the songs that they know. And boy, they sure sing a lot. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just follow along, Jack and Jim, and them. I'll tell you, they lead, and I just try to follow. <laughs> That's not fair. Heavenly Father, we uh, wait for our study today. We know that you look into our hearts, dear Heavenly Father, and we ask you to uh, to bless us as we hopefully that our hearts will be towards you each day. We're studying about Saul, who had a great heart change, dear Heavenly Father, and, and to become Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. As we move this morning into his first missionary journey, we pray that each of us will follow him along as if we were walking in his footsteps, seeing where he was going and the cities that he visited and the people that he met and the conversions that he had as a result of the work of, uh, of the missionary uh, field that he's in, dear Heavenly Father. Help us each day to be better Christians, and we love you, dear Heavenly Father, in Christ's name we pray. All of us say, Amen. 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 Okay, let's do a little review from last week. Paul went to Jerusalem. This is after his period of time with the Lord, which we think were a couple of years, okay? And so he goes to Jerusalem, but none of the uh, apostles are there except for Peter. There's James, who is Peter, uh, Christ's half brother there, and he's the leader of the church. But he goes to uh, and stays with Peter for 15 days. But when he goes to the uh, synagogue for his last time there, he sees this vision. And the Lord comes to him and says, you're not welcome here in Jerusalem. You've got to get out of here. They're not going to accept you here. We, I need you to go to the Gentiles. So he goes a full circle back to his hometown in Tarsus, which is in uh, Turkey. Paul then starts spending his time with the Gentile nation. The Gentiles were too kind. They were just regular people, and they had a lot of pagan worship that's going on. So you can imagine how difficult it is sometimes to teach someone. And, and I know you've probably come into this at some point in time. Uh, and, and just a question for you. Is it easier, as a general rule, to get to a person with the Word of God that's an established person within a, a, domino, a denominational group or whatever group it might be, or somebody who's never heard the word. One has never heard, never heard. Yes, very obvious. This is what happened with Paul. Now, these people, when he winds up, we get to the second missionary journey, he's in Athens. All they do is, is they've got a God for everything. And then he tells them about the unknown God. But I have found it very difficult, personally, to be able to move people that are established within a, a, a certain religious group. Very difficult to do that. And, but I'll leave it there. But here's what Paul's facing. He's facing a, a, a pagan society that has done nothing but worship emperors and small gods. But he's able to go to them because of Peter's vision going to Cornelius. We want to elaborate on that. We went through that, how he went to him. Peter did, because, and he didn't want to go. And we're going to see how Peter still has some issues with the Gentiles when he comes to that. They start getting in Antioch. When Paul was in Tarsus, in Antioch, they start, the Gentiles started coming to Christ. 
Well, Barnabas needed help. He said, I need your help. So he recruited Paul to come back to Antioch. And they stayed there for a year. And within that year period, there were a tremendous number of conversions. But the leadership received. Notice the church leadership. In this case, it would have been whom? Elders who had been set up in the church there at Antioch received a communication from the Holy Spirit to set apart Barnabas and Paul for the first missionary journey in Bible history. As we said, we know that a number of the disciples left Jerusalem after the stoning of Stephen, and they went to various places. We noticed Philip in a different place. We noticed all the others in different places, and they were serving God. They were are giving the good news, but it wasn't a what. In other words, we like a plan, don't we? Don't you like a plan? Don't you put a plan together and say, oh, I'm going to do this. May not work out. Uh, Evan was talking about it this morning. You know, every morning you wake up, something different's going on. <laughs> most of us have a plan for the week or maybe for a month or whatever it might be. There were no concise, no uh, uh, plans that were set up for what we call a missionary journey, which is nothing but a journey to areas to preach the word. Evangelism, that's what we're talking about. We do that all the time now. We have people that do it. But this was the first time this had happened. But the interesting thing is the Holy Spirit came to the elders. They didn't come to Paul and Barnabas. Now, obviously, they heard the message from the elders. Go and preach the word to the Gentiles. Let's get on this missionary journey. I'm not going to go through this in detail again. We did last week, but basically they were in Syria, Antioch, over to Cyprus, over to what is now, uh, certainly is Turkey, which is Perga, Antioch and Pisidia, Iconium, Derby, Lystra, finally coming back through Italia, back to Antioch. Two years. Two years traveling mm. in this area. Yeah, I mentioned last week, if you remember, these all, as best we can determine on these three missionary journeys, maybe four, and we'll discuss the fourth possible, over 10,000 miles of traveling. And this wasn't in a Honda. It wasn't in a, uh, uh, it wasn't even in horse and carriage. It was probably walking or with, uh, I don't know, whether it was camels or whether it was other. They don't talk about transportation very much yep. in here in terms of that part of it. So here's where we're starting, AD 46 and 47. If you want to turn to Acts, the 13th chapter, that's where we're going to be. Uh, that's where the missionary journey begins. Latter part of 12 starts in 13. But I need a volunteer. Who's my first volunteer this morning? I don't see a lot of hands raised, you know. <laughs> I don't think I can see the board. Huh? Just a minute here. Computer's in the way. Hey, man. Okay, Jim, you're up. We got to stand up. <laughs> I am the author of one of the Gospels, cousins of, cousin of Barnabas. I was a helper on the first missionary journey. I was young and became discouraged and decided to return home. However, I did go on to the on the next missionary journey with only Barnabas, as Paul did not think me dependable. Years later, Paul calls me a fellow worker. And near the end of Paul's life, Paul asked Timothy to bring me to him. Obviously, I had matured through the years and had become a faithful servant of the Lord. Paul recognized my progress and considered me a valuable companion. Who am I? Mark. Mark. John Mark. Here we have John Mark, okay? He joins Barnabas and Paul for the first missionary journey. And you see the story here, and we'll, we'll enhance it just a little bit more in a few moments. But the idea of having those three people going out and went over and they, they came out of uh, Seleucia all the way over to uh, Cyprus. And I'll tell you, I'm, I'm hitting too many things this morning. <laughs> AD 46, Barnabas, John, Mark, and Paul began their journey, sailing from Seleucia, Syria, to the island of Cyprus, to a town named Salamis. They were found, where they found many Jews who had heard the gospel. We don't know how, I don't know how, they heard the gospel. This is Cyprus. This is an island off the coast there. I don't know how they did. I saw the Bible tells us. And they had heard the gospel. All right? Got to be somebody that was in Jerusalem at one time. 
How else could they have possibly heard the good news and learned from the disciples and or the apostles there? Not a big point, but just to make a note. From Salamis, they traveled to Pamphos, uh, known for its immorality and worshiping Venus. Here, they ran into their first major spiritual obstacle, which is often the case with God's plan, providing an opportunity. Now, I told you last week, Sherry and I have been to Pampas, and it's a, a Greek and, and Turkish uh, city, Cypriots, and it's split in half, basically. And that city, you have to go, it's just like going through a, a checkpoints, to even get from one side to the other. It's still that way today, in terms of that part of it. Okay, next volunteer. Who is it? Sherry? Oh, 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 I know that name. I know that name very well, by the way. I hope so. <laughs> okay. I was a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet, attendant of the uh, proconsul Sergius Paulus. Against my counsel, Sergius Paulus wanted to hear the word of God, so he sent for Paul. I stopped them on the way to see the proconsul. Paul told me, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and tr trickery. You will never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord. Now, the hand of God is against you. You're going to be blind and for a time will be unable to see the light of the sun. <clears throat> if you're looking at 13th chapter, you should be able to tell me that. Yes. Lord Jesus. Wow, well, welcome. I, said, I didn't see it. It slipped in on me there. I'm telling you. Bar Jesus. Okay, he was a false prophet and a sorcerer. Sorcerers, you know, they, they were plentiful throughout the Greek world. Sorcerers and prophets. And all of these people telling them, we'll read about in the second journey, or I think it's the second journey of where the girl had these uh, powers to... Uh, uh, to actually tell the future, and Paul uh, pulled you know the demons out from her, and so forth. So you see what Paul and Barnabas and John Mark are facing here. They're facing a situation where there's uh, the proconsul wants to hear the word of God. <clears throat> what does this remind it? Remind you of? Now you're the hand of the Lord. And you're going to be blind. Who was blinded? Saul. Oh, Saul. 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 Well, Saul, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he was he was blinded for a period of time for three days. Okay. I don't know how long this guy was going to be blinded. It does say for a time and so forth. But he, you know, the false people, in terms of that part of it, um, they people who reject resist God are basically what? Blind spiritually. Mm. And you have to figure out some way to turn that blindness into uh, to seeing. And that's a role that we have as Christians to try to possibly do that. He got a physical blindness that matched his spiritual blindness. I'm ready for another volunteer. Who's up next? Who's up next? Young lady? Uh, Jim? <laughs> From Patmos, they sailed to Persia, capital of... Pamphylia, Turkey. It was there that John Mark left. It disturbed Paul because they were making inroads into the Gentile population. Hmm. Paul never understood the reason for John Mark's departure. He may have objected to Paul's leadership or that the Gentiles was not required to be circumcised. Eventually, John Mark's departure would drive a wedge between Barnabas and Paul. Thank you very much. That tells us a lot right there of what was going on. You had this young man, Mark, and we do know that. John Mark was a young man at that time. And we saw what eventually happened. He's become just a, almost a soulmate of, uh, of Paul later on uh, in his journeys and things of that sort. In fact, John Mark joins him in prison in Rome uh, all, all these years after that. Uh, but this time, you know, Paul's a focused person. Why would you leave us, John Mark? Well, we'll get into that second possible reason. Don't know what the reason is because it never explains it exactly. All right, because you know, uh, being John Mark being the cousin of Barnabas, he probably thought, "Hey, Barnabas, and he's the older person or the uh, the more adult, the more seasoned uh, Christian. He should be leading this expedition or whatever it is. That might have been it." But we're going to discuss more this idea of the Gentiles not being uh, 
circumcised in terms of that part of it, to see that and seeing how uh, the um, <coughs> it comes about. From Perga, they went to Pisidia Antioch in the mountains of Galatia, also a place of pagan worship with a great temple dedicated to Ascanus. I looked that up. I can't find much on that particular god at all. Uh, so if anybody has any information on that, I've tried to find out who it is. Anyway, the chief deity of the city. They went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, the rulers of the synagogue invited Paul to speak. The Gentiles were honored and received the word of God. We took those who were receptive and started a church that lasted years. That to me is a very good statement. Anytime you start a church and it's able to become self-sufficient, grow on its own after that. Familiar, I'm familiar with uh, Honduras. We did a lot of missionary work there in Honduras. And seven to eight, ten years ago, the church that I was with before started going there. And it's like, it's like this, up, down, mm. up, down. You leave them for a period of time. They just went back this year. I think I mentioned that. Just got back about a week or two ago. I was had lunch with, our, with the minister from there this week. And they had a wonderful meal. They had 150 something people coming to vacation Bible school and to the Bible studies and uh, and so forth while they were there. But what seems to happen is what's that support, whether it be physical support or financial support, which that requires a lot of financial report, as our elders know here with the work that goes into that sort. So, so care. Getting people who are willing to commit themselves and stay with the Lord. And we have, you know, there's congregations all over this United States that's happened, the same thing has happened. They've just gone away. Uh, I forgot the number, I won't even quote the number, but a tremendous number of churches of Christ lost due to inactivity and not being there every single year. A lot more than is being set up. And I'm not about here in the United States. I'm not talking about AD or I'm not talking about these other places. So we have to be mindful of that in terms of that part of it. So they go and they go to the city of Antioch and went to synagogue there. The Jewish opposition increased and it stirred up the people there. And so the terminology biblically says that Paul, Barnabas, shook the dust off their feet and left Antioch for Iconium. What does it mean by shaking the dust all that? That was used in Mark. That's what the Lord told them, right? When he sent out the two by twos, he said, go in here and do this, all right? But if they won't listen to you, mm -hmm. oh, That's tough. listen, he had the world to cover at that time. You can't, you can't stay and beat your head against the wall constantly against people who do not want to what? Change. Want to listen. Okay? So that's basically what we're talking about here. Okay? Next volunteer. Who is it? Ah, the young gentleman right here that just joined us, Philip, right? Yes, yes. Now, well, Philip is a very important biblical name. You know? <laughs> uh -huh. that's, sorry, no real relation. <laughs> yeah, but you can claim it going all the way back in the okay? Let's see if I got that right here. All right. Well, I'll tell you. Okay, there you go. That one? That one? Iconum was a Greek city. We preached there in the synagogue and great numbers of both Jews and Gentiles. <laughs> However, <laughs> unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against us. You want me to read the second one too? Yes, please. After about three months, the opposition became so great that an attempt was made by the unbelievers to abuse us and stone us. We became aware of it and fled to Lystra. It was obvious not um, or not, it was obviously not time for us to become martyrs. Man, Paul, he gets stoned every time he turns around. How in the world did he live through it? Well, this one right here, he was going to be stoned. But you know, later on, he gets stoned, and we have to work, figure out how in the world did he live through that. Stephen never lived through it. 
and so forth. Stoning was just the methodology that they used. To, you know, it's like a, an execution. That's basically what it is in terms of that part of it. At this point, there's three categories of Jews. First of all, kind of like today, all you do, you have unbelievers. They were just unbelievers. They wouldn't accept the Messiah in any way, form, or fashion. Second, you had Jewish converts who could accept the message as God sent and the Messiah, but could not accept the Gentiles as equals. They wanted no part of it. They simply could not accept the teaching that opened the floodgates for what? For the Gentiles. For the Gentiles to come in and be equal to them. Mm -hmm. This has never happened before. Look back in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened. But you've got to remember that even in the Old Testament, everyone would certainly tell us probably where it is, it was the preparation for the future was always the whole world. It wasn't just the Jewish nation. It was the whole world. But he had to get a basis for his, God had to, through Jesus, he had to get a basis for belief and to understand. Now, I don't mention this very much in here. I do it in certain places. But what was one of the things that Paul and them were doing all during these missionary journeys? It's mentioned only a few times. They had to show God's power. They had to show these people that they were different from all these other people, whoever it might be. So it was through God's power, through the Holy Spirit, through however means, but through them, miracles. They did miracles. That was the only way. That's how it started out. Proof that Christ was the Son of God. Give them that good news. Now, the Jews, a lot of them never accepted this. You know, they say it was superstition, it was this and that. And they, it was kind of like what happens today politically. They keep everything under the, you know, if you don't want something to be told, you just keep it in the, well, certain media within that environment, things of that sort. Well, they did not want this to get out to all of the other people around Jerusalem and wherever else it be, because one of the things they feared they still feared Roman persecution. And the more, if there was going to be riots, if there's going to be anything going on, they didn't want that. This is the Sanhedrin in terms of Jerusalem, the way it was there. It was, they were against the, the Messiah, but the main thing was they didn't want people in any kind of uprising. They wanted this, things to stay as it was. They were in control of the Jewish people there, and the Romans kind of left them alone. The third group were Jewish converts who were willing to accept Christ and the converted Gentiles. At this point, that was a small group relative to the other ship. So just kind of want to give you an idea about those people today, uh, those people and how that worked out in terms of the uh, types of the people that were there. Next volunteer, young gentleman back here. I actually See, you raise your hand. Yes. You don't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Before that, I'd like to comment on what you were just yeah, talking about. If that's sure. all right, I don't think we can we can underestimate the, the uh, impact of the, the controversy, the Jew Gentile controversy in the Book of Acts. Um, the acceptance of the Gentiles we take it for granted today because we're Gentiles and we're Christians, and so uh, you know we don't see the big deal about that. It was a huge deal in the early church. Oh, and and, and God, not only you mentioned miracles. If you look in Acts chapter 10, the situation with Cornelius, yes. who was a Gentile, um, he, uh, all kinds of visions and interventions by God had to be made in order for him to be accepted exactly. and converted to Christianity. Exactly. And uh, God, I mean, God engineered that all the way from A to Z. And, yeah. and, 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 and made it, he had to make it be seen by the, 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 the Christian leaders, mainly, mainly Peter, but others as well. Peter had to convince his, you know. The well, had, first of all, he had to convince himself, right? <laughs> that, yes. that this was really what it is. And then we, we fight this battle all the way through here until we have the Jerusalem Council uh, to get to, uh, to do this. This, this was not a two months. This was a, a number of years. This was not something was done. Troy makes such a strong point. 
You know, and the other group, which we haven't even talked about, was another segregated group, and that was the Samaritans. What did Christ do there? I know I'm doing some reversion here, but Christ with this Samaritan lady, she, they were just as they were almost just as hated as much as the Gentiles were. And we know the story behind the Samaritans as a part of the group there. All right, Troy, you read that hand right oh, stuff. Got it. Read this one. Uh, <laughs> right, in Lister, we faced the most difficult challenge. We spoke in the synagogue and performed miracles through the Holy Spirit. Barnabas and Paul attracted so much attention and began calling us gods. Barnabas, Zeus, and Paul, Hermes. In Greek mythology, it was common for the gods to come to earth in human form, though not always for the good. We appealed to the crowd to recognize the true God instead of worshiping them. We couldn't preach to these pagan worshipers the same way we preached to the Jews. God's word was totally foreign to them. Boy, that's the key. That's what we were just talking about before. You cannot approach someone about the good news of, the, of, the, of Christ the same way with a non-believer, non-believer in God, all of these things that you do with a believer in God and they're associated with somebody else. You have a basis at least to do it, but it's still a difficult task. Well, that's what they're facing here. God, he's all, here's all our gods right here. Zeus, Hermes, all of these are the gods that we're being told to worship. Remember, Christianity did not become the national religion for how many, for how long? Till 400 years, maybe 300, 400 years. So there wasn't a national religion within that, except the Jews considered them to be the only religion. And it was recognized there in Rome as the only religion available to that in terms of that part of it. Well, that was important. If yes. Christianity, and that, that's part of what we'll see in the later the conflict here, if Christianity was deemed new, then it is illegal. And that was the whole thing. Like Judaism had its own little social granted status under the Roman government back, you know, was it 23 or so um, BC? When all that stuff occurred there, when the Jews came, when the Jews sought out Rome to get help from uh, Antiochus in that whole realm, exactly. that, that gave them that special status and they've been losing that special status throughout. You know, I mean, there's been a lot going on up to this point because, you know, we're what, 47 or so and we're 47. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're, we're getting close to that, that, that crescendo here with the temple in 70 AD there, you know, with the destruction there. So the idea that Christianity, as soon as Christianity became seen as separate, it became illegal. And then the Roman persecution of Christianity started and the Jews, well, they were persecuting the Jews as well at the same time, but there's a big change that happens. So I think this the point, persecution you're talking about here, folks, is the persecution of the illegal group more than, than anything else. Because they, they, because they were being persecuted both ways, both from the Roman government and from the, uh, from the Jews that were, did not believe the persecution was there too. And because we see that all the Jews came down to Iconium the Jews were persecuting the Christians. Yes. That's where the Christian persecution yes. was occurring. Okay. It wasn't yes. until later that that's, no, that's true. No, that no Roman no, persecution. And overall, they get it. They get it from both sides. All right, eventually, and through all that part of history. In, in the Book of Acts, uh, as we read through the events that took place in the Book of Acts, most of the persecution was from the Jews. Yes, uh, and, and it was all, only tangentially from uh, Romans. And then later, at, as Dylan says here, uh, which is uh, well, correct, yeah. uh, as soon as the, the the Romans recognized that there was a split, they 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 saw that there was a difference. Then it became all uh, you know, no no holds barred against the Christians. Yeah, I mean it was yeah because I mean, Claudius yeah because it was once Claudius you know he expelled the Jews, but they expelled the Jews because the Jews were having an uprising over this person named Christus, exactly. believed to be Christ, right? So that's when he expelled them, but he still considered them all the same. And it wasn't until Nero, and when Nero decided he burned to burn down Rome, yeah. right. that's when he decided to persecute and blame the Christians on it. And that was the starting and the foundation between the difference between Christians and Jews from the Roman perspective. Yeah, they, so they didn't even, you know, they, the group which occurs large enough to have a, have a big effect. They just weren't large enough at that point to have a big effect. So <laughs> when you talk about and you think about 23 years later, as you mentioned, 
the whole temple was destroyed, and everything was gone in AD 70. So it didn't take a lot of years for this to happen. But remember, we were going along pretty, pretty good at this point in time. We were starting churches. We were, but remember, we're not close to Jerusalem. I mean, we we're way out in the hinterlands doing all the work here in terms of that, that part of it. Paul and Barnabas tore off their clothes to show the pagans they were completely human, just like them. They still wouldn't listen, even when we cried out telling them they must turn from these usually things to the living God who made everything. At this point, the crisis continued to escalate. Jews from Antioch and Iconium had followed us and continued to incite the Gentiles. Remember, they had to be, uh, when they went to Lystra, uh, they were kicked out, basically. In other words, these are that group I'm talking about. The unbelieving Jews are the Jews that did not want to be involved with the Gentiles. All right? I don't mean the combination of them or whatever it might be in terms of that part of it. The Jews loathed the Gentiles. They hated them so bad. But they were willing to compromise even this hostility that they had against the Gentiles to do what? To get rid of Paul and Silas and that group. Now, boy, that takes a big jump to, to, to kind of come together with the Gentiles. They managed to overcome their differences and prejudice, winning cooperation from the Gentiles to stone us. One minute the Gentiles were worshiping us, and the next ready to kill us. It's ironic. Isn't it? how, quick, <laughs> how quick things can turn, right? Paul remembers Stephen preaching to a riotous crowd who wouldn't listen mm -hmm. to the truth. Coming back, and it? Coming mm -hmm. back to it in terms of that part of it. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city to die. Paul should have died, save for the grace of God, who still had plans for him. It's so interesting, uh, nothing is mentioned here about how Paul survived this. But he survived it enough. They had told him to leave. He wouldn't even leave. He goes back in and stays another day or so there within the city. God still had plans for him. We're here on this earth for a reason. Save ourselves and to help save as many other people as possible. Until God decides that that's not, well, that, that we're through with that work, we've got to keep going doing it. Amen to that? Amen. So that's what we have to look at every day, is that that's our role. That's what we're here for. Yeah, we have day-to-day -day stuff that's going on. Listen, Paul and him, what did they do Monday through Saturday, or Friday, actually, maybe? They were tent makers. They, uh, they worked just like the other people did. they go into the cities, and that's what they did. They had, they, you think they were supported by a bunch of churches? No way were they done. We see about how support is required, and they take support back to Jerusalem from the various congregation, current places of that sort. But day to day, they had to live. Now, I don't know how many. I've got a feeling there was more than just Paul and Barnabas, okay, of course, Mark's left, that they had people with them, other people to help them and do that kind of work. But it's not mentioned too much about this. And we see here, the meeting of a new person. Volunteer. Volunteer. This year. Uh, <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> it's kind of sad, but oh, you changed it. Okay. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. I really, let's see. I was the son. Uh, me, oh, see yeah. It. Yeah. I, I really sure can't good. see it. See it in there. It's hard to see. I was the son of a Greek father and a yeah. Jewish mother, joining Paul during one of his later missionary journeys. Oh. Paul addresses me as my true son in the faith. I joined Paul in my early 20s, having already distinguished myself as faithful. I served as Paul's representative to several churches in Corinth and Philippi. I was with Paul when he wrote 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians 1 and 2, Thessalonians, and Philemon. Paul told me to do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Who are we talking about here? Timothy. Timothy. Exactly. Timothy. You know, this advice that Paul gave Timothy 
is the advice that all of us need to receive. To show ourselves approved because the words of the Lord are God breathing and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness as a servant of God may be. We are thoroughly equipped for every good work. Second Timothy. He counseled his, he calls him his dear son, Timothy, from a heart of love, wanting Timothy to stand firm in his own faith. You know, remember he was, uh, uh, his father was not, it, it even mentions it, he was not a follower. He was a Greek, but he was not a follower. <clears throat> so the question about is, is that such an important statement that Paul made directed to them and directly to us in terms of, of who that was. Okay, next volunteer. Who we got here? Jack, you ready? Sir. The next morning we left for Derby and preached, making many disciples. One of them, Gaius, would later accompany Paul through Greece. This was the last stop before our return to Antioch, Syria. We reversed our course from Derby, doubling back through Lystra, Iconium, and Pisidian, Antioch, encouraging, encouraging them to remain true to the faith. In all the churches, we selected and appointed elders by the laying on of hands, praying, and fasting. We read this the first time about laying on the hands, praying, and fasting. Where do we see that first? That memory of that verse? Where is that first used? So I'm not mistaken, Troy, I know you will remember this, some of you will, but I believe that's where they used it for the, uh, when they talked about the deacons, right? And that's the first time when we set up the deacons uh, are people who would support the message of the people there. I believe that's where it was. You mean the but, laying on of hands or pray fasting and the laying on? Uh, the laying on hands, praying and fasting, yes. Just, I don't think they did any fasting. They, they may not have. I, I know thought that was when they sent them out of Antioch as the first. Yes, yeah, that was true. But I remember the first part here. I'm just trying to come back to it. They do lay on hands. The first time. Pray and about. so elders, that's how, and we see this a couple of other times, where that's how elders were uh, decided upon within the churches. But notice what we were talking about a while ago. They doubled back, wanting to what? Encourage it and try to give them more strength. Paul wanted to go back so many times. And as we get into the second missionary journey, we see that he was not allowed to do that. God said, no, 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 no. You're, you're going to go a different direction this time. He wanted to go back to all those churches that they had set up before and try to do the work there in terms of that part. Thank you. Our return took us from Italia. Now that was on the seashore. They went down a different way because they wanted to, to sail all the way back to Antioch. And um, so they, uh, uh, the journey started and it had been two years. God had opened the doors of faith. The Gentile world, our journey was tremendously successful, though not without great uh, obstacles. And there, I kind of list the obstacles that they faced. The travel itself, walking all those miles. The confrontation with Bar Jesus, John Mark leaving, driven out of the various cities, temptation to receive adoration as gods. Wouldn't that have been easy to say, oh, all right, mm -hmm. they consider me a god. Let me be, I'll just, I'll just accept that. Mm -hmm. Can't do that. What's, is that not the same thing that's happening today? People accepting idols of worship. Mm -hmm. Whether they want to say it's an idol of worship or not, or whatever, we, wherever we spend our time is where our heart is. Agree? I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I know I'm talking about day to day stuff, but, but they would not be deterred from the work God had to do. I remained Paul in Syria, Antioch for over a year. I won't get to get yeah. into this as uh, deep as I want to, so I'm probably going to stop right here. Paul comes back to Antioch. Now, we'll hit these four parts, but we'll go into the detail of them next week. Peter comes to Jews, and they have a dispute concerning the activities of the Jews, Gentiles, and Jews. This is where the circumcision, things of that sort come about, about the Jews wanting the, the Gentiles to be circumcised before they can be saved. 
They came down from Judea teaching the Gentile brothers that circumcision was a necessary condition. This is where Paul wrote his first letter to the churches in Galatia. He had been there in Galatia. Hearing that some Jews, see what's happened? I don't know whether it's been a year, whether it's been six months, I don't know the time span. He hears that some Jews within the congregations were insisting the Gentiles adhere to the old law. He had taught them already there. But he had not become official. Where was the official head of the, of the church at that time? Jerusalem. It was Jerusalem. We have no question about that. They are the ones that dictated what was going on. And until they approved it, it was not going to be changed. It was not going to be done. That's why you had to go back to the Jerusalem Council and get this approved. Now, we do know that there's things that the pagans did, like uh, eating blood by animals and things of that sort, that they had to stop, all right? But you see the, you'll see the kind of Gentiles that we're talking about here that did certain things that were against anybody's law. Barnabas and Paul was chosen to go to Jerusalem to speak to Peter and the leaders of Jerusalem Church concerning the disputed requirements for Gentiles to be saved. I'll leave that with you today. Thank you so much for your attention, and we'll see you next week. Oh, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. If you were um, about Crete, in uh, chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Cretans and Arabs will hear them, I need to run out to them in our own languages. So there's Crete members from Crete and Peter yeah. Sir. So that's where they heard about the gospel. Yeah. You that you said you didn't know. Right? Well, I didn't. No, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't so, know where in that part of it. Yeah. And so forth. And, you know, I don't get involved in all Oh, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> you got to almost, you know, you got to, I try to hit as much as I can, but if you give up too much of it, you get, you get so involved in things when you want to get the highlights. Well, well, kind of kind of of yeah, yeah. I, I can't do it on a timeline, that's for sure. I spent, I, I spent, I, I spent the last nine months teaching Jose. Oh, so, and I didn't even finish the book. So, you know, I understand. <laughs> about halfway. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everything that Paul did.